22 minutes Keep past convincing. seven. Good morning. Uh, time for a look at the newspapers. Uh, I'm going to start with the Sunday Times. It's reporting on new Prime Minister Boris Johnson vowing to achieve Brexit by any means necessary, he says. Well, Minister Michael Gove says the government is now working on the assumption that the EU will not offer a new withdrawal deal. The Sunday Telegraph follows a similar line, saying that the Chancellor Sajid Javid is funding preparations for a no-deal Brexit, so new money there for that. But not all Conservatives are behind that idea. The Observer claims former Chancellor Philip Hammond has been talking to Labour about plans that could prevent Mr Johnson forcing through a no-deal. In today's mail, they've done some polling. A few of the papers have, which reportedly show a 10% increase in support for Boris Johnson, fueling speculation that he may well call a general election. So those are the front pages. Let's have a look at what's inside. Tom Harwood has joined us. He's from the centre-right Westminster news site, Guido Fawkes, uh, to tell us what's caught his eye inside. Tom, morning to you. Nice Good morning. To see you. Um, let's talk about the polls. You picked out this story from The Observer, uh, suggesting a bit of a Boris bounce. That's right. There are four newspapers this morning that are running separate polls, and all of them show a big increase in support for the Conservative Party off the back of Boris Johnson becoming Prime Minister. And this is mainly driven by a decrease in support for the Brexit Party. So you can see this amalgamation of the Tory and Brexit Party vote in a way that simply hasn't happened between the Labour Party and the Lib Dems. And it's a lot easier to see how in a general election scenario the Brexit Party and Tory vote combine, whereas the Labour Party and Lib Dem vote stay separate, and that could deliver a Conservative majority. It's pretty strategic, isn't it, to come up north in your first few days and, and make the sort of promises he did yesterday. Do you think that's resonated already with the electorate? Absolutely. It seems like it's a sort of a, it's a Brexit themed premiership. It's mm. talking to those more forgotten communities, those communities that politicians don't often focus on, talking to the places that voted leave and, and the communities up especially in the north of England. Um, and I think that that's somewhere that the Conservatives are really going to focus on for the next few months especially. The European election show, didn't they, that that is still the fundamental issue in politics, isn't it? So we all thought we knew a lot about Boris, uh, Boris Johnson, new Prime Minister, uh, but the Times has, or the Sunday Times, gone to find out a little bit more about family history. Just explain what they've found. That's right, this is incredible. The Times have sent out reporters to a small village in northern Turkey where Boris's ancestors are. His great-grandfather um, was a general there and um, there, are, there, there are these all these blonde-haired Turks living in this um, northern Turkish village who they've interviewed and the village loves Boris they uh, I think they offered to sacrifice a goat for him um, but they that haven't yet they haven't yet done that <laughs> There's Fantastic. so much in the papers this morning. Um, and also staying with that political theme. And we were talking about this on the programme yesterday. Mm. And, of course, this is the advice from Re Jacob Rees-Mogg, isn't it, um, about uh, what some of the staff might consider in terms of grammar, spelling, all that sort of thing, punctuation. Mm. Uh, but he's been getting some advice from a rather different source. That's right. There's a, a rapper called Big Bad Spray who's offered a sort of alternative... Uh, style guide that includes emojis and text speak and um, it's I, I'm not sure it's something that I could see Jacob Rees-Mogg really going for. <laughs> um, I think I think there, there, there is something important though in, in terms of uh, politicians being more authentic and not trying to pretend to be something they're not. I think a lot of people don't really appreciate it when politicians sort of pretend to like football teams or, or speak in ways that doesn't come naturally to them. And, and I think there's something quite unique about Jacob Rees-Mogg in terms of how he doesn't pretend to be anything he isn't. And that's what uh, is driving his popularity. But at the same time, there is some vocabulary that enters parlance that isn't necessarily grammatically correct but we get used to, and he's obviously not really budging on allowing that to sneak through, is he? No, um, I don't think you'd expect, though, in, in the position of leader of the House, it's a quite a, it's quite a perfunctory role. Mm. It's, it's something that you expect to be a stickler for detail, looking over those rules of the House of Commons. Um, I think other cabinet ministers in other positions take very different views on this. You'll well, know the, the inside gossip. Will, will some staff find it a little bit patronising to be told where to use commas and apostrophes? <laughs> oh, I think so, but there's, there's always sort of style guides, and, and a lot of this is when they're drafting things for Jacob Rees-Mogg himself. So things that will be signed by Jacob Rees-Mogg, things going out under his name, he'll want it to be in his style. Fair enough. It's interesting when we're being told that politicians are trying to get down with the kids and they're trying to, you know, kind of appeal to a younger audience and then, you know, quite clearly and, as you said, unashamedly, uh, stickler for the rules. Um, this is a story I've been talking about this morning as well. Uh, a big brawl on a cruise ship uh, coming back from the Norwegian fjords and two people have been held for, well, reportedly being involved in this. What do we know about it and uh, what's the clown connection? 
Well, there was a black tie dinner, as far as I understand, and someone um, appeared in, in, uh, in the area on the ship dressed as a clown, which really riled some guests up the wrong way. They were told this would be a very formal cruise, no fancy dress, no silliness, and the silliness seems to have spawned outright anger. Um, and what the Express is suggesting is that it was all the heat that got people really riled up. And it was a really quite friend, uh, it, it was a frenzied and, and, and frantic brawl that um, there was a journalist on it um, from ITV on the, on the cruise who said that he'd never seen anything like it. Quite an extreme reaction to fancy dress that, isn't it? <laughs> right. I mean, I don't think clowns are the most popular things, but I'm not sure it ever should incite violence. The well, thing that upset me most was they had to shut the buffet. <laughs> That'd be enough to cause a riot, yeah, wouldn't it, here? Um, I mean, and what the Express is clear there, it showed pictures of uh, ladies arriving at York races. So, I mean, it's making the point about dress codes. And mm. our relationship with dress codes is quite interesting in this country, isn't it? We don't want to be told what to do. But then at the same time, there are... And I may, maybe this plays into the same argument of Jacob rees mm. about upholding standards. Mm. So it's about what is socially acceptable to do in that sort of scenario. Right, I think there are expectations and codes and rules. And it's sort of how society functions. Because without expectations, you don't know where you are or... Um, what's going on? So um, I, I can sort of understand, but but violence really does seem an incredible overreaction. Mm, to a clown yeah, outfit. If there's a dress code, stick to it. <laughs> uh, Tom, nice to see you. Uh, you'll be back a little later, but thank you for now.